Good morning from NASA headquarters and welcome to today's virtual event. The Artemis Generation Q&A with astronaut Laurel O'Hara, hosted by Senator Shelley Moore Capito and Representative Keller, Carol Miller, as well as NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine with the students of Mercer County, West Virginia. Welcome. Today, I am honored to introduce Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator Capito was elected by the people of West Virginia to the United States Senate in 2014. She is the first female U.S. Senator in West Virginia's history. She sits on the Senate Appropriations Committee's Commerce Justice Science Subcommittee and the Senate Commerce Science Transportation, Aviation and Space Subcommittee, which funds and provides oversight of NASA respectively. Now I am pleased to turn it over to our host, Senator Capito. Thank you, Daphne, and thank everybody for being uh, with us today. And hello, Mercer County. Uh, great effort. I've seen a lot of uh, technology in the works, getting all of you students connected. I know many of you are, haven't been in school as much as you would like. So this is a great opportunity to bring NASA right into your classroom or into your home. So I want to thank uh, all the uh, teachers at, in Mercer County who have helped us get this together. I'm really excited to be here with NASA Administrator um, Bridenstine. He's been to West Virginia before, so he knows exactly where you are, and a, certainly Congresswoman Carol Miller, but most especially today, uh, Laurel O'Hara, a, a woman astronaut who is going to tell you all about the exciting things about space and space travel and how you as West Virginia girls may aspire to that just as you're sitting in your classroom. So we really want to talk to you and I'm briefly going to talk about what, how, how Laurel and others get, get to where they are. Uh, it's through uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know how sometimes you dread that math class? Well, that's so important in order for you to experience the science and, uh, and space and travel that, that we're going to hear about today. Uh, you know, if you like working with computers, if you like playing our co computer, you like STEM. If you like, if you like math class, that's STEM. Uh, if your parents work for Intuit down there in, in Mercer County, that's STEM. So if you like to do uh, see, every, every now and then watch a TikTok maybe, uh, that's STEM. So there's all kinds of really valuable things that you can be doing. And I am really, really excited about the, the, the uh, uh, Artemis uh, program that's going to be putting more people on the moon, including, as the administrator will tell you, a woman on the moon. So West Virginia has a proud history in NASA. We have Katherine Johnson, who was one of the first uh, mathematicians from Greenbrier County that came to the highest levels of NASA to make sure that our astronauts would be safe. To Homer Hickam, who's a great author from Southern West Virginia, close to where you are, who was an engineer for NASA for many, many years. So I'm going to turn this over to my friend, Carol Miller, who's your representative. And Carol, it's great to see you virtually. And again, thank you all Mercer County and thank you NASA for doing this for, for West Virginians today. Thank you, Shelley, and it's great to see you. We we used to run into each other on Fridays on the airplane going home, but that hasn't happened from Congress in quite a while. Right. It's so exciting. What a neat opportunity for all the young women in Mercer County to be able to hear and speak to a female NASA astronaut. That is just so cool. And thank you, Shelley, for hosting today's virtual event. And helping us to discuss the great work that NASA does and all the possibilities we have for our next generation. And all you third through fifth grade girls, thank you for participating today. I hope you understand what a unique opportunity you have to be able to learn what it's like to visit our next frontier and how one will live in zero gravity. And to you teachers and parents, another thank you for assisting the students and our children today because they are our next leaders, engineers, and maybe even our next astronauts who could be landing on the Mars or the moon traveling through space. Our district, which covers most of South, Southern West Virginia, has a true novelty with the space and NASA. And without repeating what Shelley said, we've got Katherine J Johnson, who was a famous NASA, NASA mathematician 
And her calculations were the ones that made it possible for the first man to land on the moon. We have Homer Hickam, whom I've met, read his book, which you, you all ought to read his book. It's terrific. He's a famous NASA engineer. And as well as from Lincoln County, we have Chuck Yeager. And he was the first pilot who broke the sound barrier, the speed of sound in flight. Senator Capito's program of Girls Rise Up works to show girls that through hard work, you can do anything you want. You've just got to have determination and hard work. As a woman, I have seen firsthand the challenges that there can be in meeting your goals. I'm sure Shelly could tell you the same thing from being told that you can or can't do something because you're a girl. But, you know, I will say we've come a long way in 50 years. We girls know what it's like to be defined by our gender, but instead, to me, it just adds value. And I will always think of myself as being a girl, even if I'm 85 years old, because I am a girl. And our perspective in making decisions is very, very important. And so just look forward to the challenges you face and turn them into opportunities. And I want you to know that you should never, ever limit yourself or give up when you meet hardship, because through failure, through being hitting stumbling blocks, that's how you learn to succeed. And um, you, you need to believe in yourself. You, and it takes a while to hear that inner voice or to, to really understand what your passion is. And that will change as you grow up. But the important thing that you all talk about all the time now is you hear about STEM, 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 STEM. I also like to talk about STEAM because it adds the arts. Um, because anybody that plays the piano or paints or draws, they're using math too. You just don't realize that you're using math because you got to count in music. You've got to have perspective and, and dimension when you're painting. So understand th through STEM and STEAM both that engineering, technology, mathematics, science, all of those things work hand in hand. And we girls have a lot of different pieces that make us be. So focus on your education. You can be the next leaders of our great country. NASA astronaut O'Hara is one that has never given up on a challenge and never limited herself to becoming the next astronaut to visit space. Currently, NASA set the goal to have a man and woman land on the moon by 2024. Wow, that's not far away. And then on to Mars by 2030 through the Artemis program. How cool is that? You all can be part of that. I have the privilege today to introduce the administrator to speak to you all. Before Mr. Bridenstein was nominated to head NASA, he represented Oklahoma's first district in Congress, just like I'm doing, and started his federal career as a pilot in the U.S. Navy. In Southern West Virginia, we work directly with technology that can help expand NASA's effort. We have the Green Bank Telescope, and I would like to invite the administrator here to visit our facilities and learn more about Green Bank. Mr. Bridenstine, thank you so much for joining today's event. I know each student here is excited to learn about NASA's future plans. Well, thank you so much, Representative Miller and Senator Capito. I just wanna say um, it's an honor to be with you uh, for this event. It's an honor to virtually be in West Virginia. I wish I could be there in person, but of course, circumstances have prevented that. But I just want you to, <laughs> I just want you to know how much I appreciate the support that both of you give to NASA and the the amazing things that we're accomplishing now, which I think will that they currently are and and will be even more so stunning achievements that will inspire this next generation to go into the STEM fields, and that's really. Uh, one of NASA's big missions, continue to accomplish these stunning achievements. A lot of people saw just recently, we launched American astronauts on American rockets from American soil again. Um, and, and that's in no small part uh, because of the efforts of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who have been very supportive of, of the NASA agenda. So we wanna thank you for, for all of that. And yes, I think both of you alluded to the fact that you know, there are lots of opportunities for women at NASA and, and, and we want to encourage that. So I'll just give you some, some important examples. Next month in November, uh, November 14th, as a matter of fact, 
uh, we're launching the first uh, the first crew to the International Space Station that is not a, a test flight. So this is actually an operational flight. And in that crew uh, is Dr. Shannon Walker. Uh, she um, is a, uh, she was a, a, a physics major undergrad and she got a, a PhD in physics and went on to be a NASA astronaut. She's done a number of amazing missions already and now she's flying in space again this time on an American rocket. So that's a, a, a great you know, development. The other thing that's important, um, and, and I know, look, we all love the Apollo program. We think back, and of course I wasn't alive then, but in 1969, we landed on the surface of the moon for the first time in human history. And then we did five more missions on top of that to land on the moon with a total of 12 people walking on the moon. Now, as much as we love the Apollo program and, and as important as it was in American history to, to establish the United States of America as preeminent in space and, and exploration and technology, um, as important as that was in those days, all of our astronauts came from fighter pilot backgrounds and test pilot backgrounds. And in those days, there were no opportunities for women. Well, today at NASA, we have a very diverse highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. And in fact, the big mission that we're doing right now to the moon, we call it the Artemis program. And, and it, it is, a, it, think, of, think of 50 years after Apollo. Apollo was you know the, early, the late 1960s, early 1970s. Here we are 50 years after Apollo, we're going back to the moon. I like to say forward to the moon because now we have the technology to actually stay on the moon for long periods of time. So we're gonna go stay on the moon. We're gonna go with commercial partners. We're gonna go with international partners. So countries all around the world are gonna unite in this effort. Um, we're gonna learn how to live and work on the moon for long periods of time. And then we're gonna take all of that knowledge to Mars. So for the first time in human history, we're gonna go to Mars. Now this program that we are developing to do this, we call Artemis. And people say, well, why, why did you call the program Artemis? Well, 50 years ago, the program was named after uh, a Greek god, <laughs> Apollo. Uh, if you guys have studied mythology, I'm, I'm not too sure at, at your grade level that you've done that yet, but, but Apollo was the name of the program in the 1960s and 1970s. Well, it just so happens that in Greek mythology, Apollo, had a twin sister and her name was Artemis and she was the goddess of the moon. So now when we go back to the moon, we get to go with all of America. And when we go with all of America, we go under the name of Apollo's twin sister, Artemis. So I think this is a, an amazing story. It shows how, how an amazing country, the United States of America has the ability to change over the last 50 years and we continue to move forward in impressive ways. So, so with that, I want to introduce Laurel O'Hara. She is our NASA astronaut that's with us today. And in fact, uh, she is in Star City, Russia. Remember what I said, when we do space exploration, it is a tool of diplomacy. So we're working with countries all over the world, including sometimes you know, countries that, are, that we have challenges with. And of course, um, Russia has been a great partner with NASA, Roscosmos and NASA have been living and working together in space now for 20 years. If you can imagine that, for 20 years, we have had American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts living and working side by side in space. And we celebrate that anniversary, the 20 year anniversary here in just a few short days this weekend. So this is a, this is a big moment. Um, and of course, Laurel O'Hara is one of those astronauts who not only is gonna have opportunities to fly into low earth orbit uh, and go to the International Space Station with all of the, the 15 countries that operate the International Space Station, but she's also very well could be uh, an astronaut on the surface of the moon and very well could be an astronaut on the surface of Mars, if you can imagine that. So I want to say to, to Laurel O'Hara, we are so excited about seeing the amazing things you're going to do in your career ahead. And, and for the, the young folks that are watching, they're saying, well, how do you get to be like somebody like Laurel O'Hara? Well, you know, she went to the University of Kansas and she studied aerospace engineering. 
Um, then she went to, to work and she did a number of internships with NASA. She went to uh, the University of Purdue, Purdue University, and she got um, a master's degree in aerospace and aeronautical engineering. Um, and of course, all of her, her hard work with NASA, she worked for a company in Oklahoma called Rocket Plane, which was, um, I think, an exciting kind of effort back uh, in the, I guess, 2000 timeframe to, to, to launch commercially into space. Um, so she has had a really amazing career, um, and, and she just graduated as, as an astronaut candidate in the last year. So this is a very exciting time, and we're looking forward to all the great things uh, that Laurel O'Hara is going to do in the future. And Laurel, I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right, good morning, and thank you, Administrator Brenstein. I am super excited to talk to you guys this morning. I'm just going to share my screen here. I have some pictures for you. All right, how's that look? Got it, it looks great. All right. All right, so this is me the sixth time I had ever put on a spacesuit, and I was struggling. I was a brand new baby astronaut in my first year of astronaut school. My classmates and I were learning how to spacewalk underwater, simulate the effects of microgravity. Now, one of the most challenging things about spacewalking is managing your safety tether. This is a cable that connects an astronaut to a space station all the time so that you don't float off into space and possibly get lost forever. One of the hard parts of working with the safety tether is that you always have to keep track of it. You always have to be looking back and checking on it and making sure it's not tangled up in something. Because if it gets tangled up in something, you potentially end up with one big giant snarl of a knot that you have to stop and untangle. So here I was, the new student at school, a lot of pressure and everyone was watching. And what do I do? I get tangled up in my safety tether. If you want to imagine, it's kind of like the spacesuit gloves are pretty big, and it's kind of like trying to unravel a ball of yarn while you're wearing oven mitts. Just kind of a big mess. And, you know, it's funny now, but at the time, I was pretty embarrassed. Um, I, you know, it was just like kind of embarrassing because everyone's watching me. But if I hadn't made that mistake in the pool while I was training, I, there was... I could have potentially made it up on orbit in space where the consequences are that much greater. Being able to make a mistake, fix it, laugh about it, and then learn from it, that's an important skill, not just for spacewalking, but also for life here on Earth. So how did I get here to be talking to you guys today? My parents told me that I was about eight years old or in second grade the first time I said I wanted to be an astronaut. I don't really remember this, but I do remember that I always really loved exploring. Um, I loved going out into the woods and going places that I'd never been before. I also really loved reading. As I got older, I had the opportunity to start flying airplanes in high school. And so as I got closer to picking a college major, I thought, well, maybe I want to study engineering. But believe it or not, math was never one of my strongest subjects. My favorite subjects were science and English and art. Uh, math just always came a little bit harder to me. Like I always thought I had to work harder than other students did just to get the same grades. But I really loved airplanes and so I wanted to study them. So I decided to study aerospace engineering in college, um, even though I knew it might be hard because of the math. And it was, but I loved what I was doing. So it didn't matter. Um, if you're passionate about something and if you have a goal, it makes slogging through those tough times that much easier. Um, because there will be tough times no matter what you're doing. And if you don't have a goal, like if you don't know what you want to do yet, that's also totally okay. But you have to pick something, make a decision and pick something and start working towards it and just keep trying new things because you never know where that's going to take you. So um, I, I worked for a couple years. Um, I started a career in rocket in, uh, working on rocket engines. But after a while, like I was just saying, after a while, I decided that wasn't really for me. Um, I wanted to do something different. So 
I actually ended up moving across the country to become an ocean engineer, working in ocean science on underwater robots, like this one you see here, Jason. Now, one of the things that I was a part of that scientists use Jason for is studying hydrothermal vents really, really deep in the ocean, like four miles deep and the life that lives there. This life isn't like you and me. It doesn't need oxygen and air to survive. The life that lives down there, the creatures that live down there live in total darkness all the time. And they survive off chemicals that seep out of cracks in the seafloor. And so it's really crazy. And what I found out is that this life is basically aliens on earth, aliens. And I thought that was really cool. And I got really, really excited about this. And it turns out that, um, that actually scientists think that the life that we might find someday on other planets, uh, life in, elsewhere in the solar system might look very similar to this life that's in our very own oceans here on earth. And so while I was working all of, on all of that, I still had in the back of my head, you know, I still wanna be an astronaut. And so every time NASA, uh, every time NASA would put out an application, I applied. And after eight years and three applications, NASA called and, and asked if I wanted to move to Houston to be a part of the 2017 NASA astronaut class. So I became a part of this really serious group of people. Uh, there are 13 of us, 11 Americans and two Canadians. We come from all different kinds of backgrounds. We're engineers, we're geologists, we're pilots. Navy SEALs, Navy Submariners, doctors. And my point is, is that there's no one right path that's the right path. Uh, we are a much stronger team because we have all of these different backgrounds and because we're different people. And with all of those differences, you know, bringing all of those differences together, we can learn from each other and become a stronger team because of it. So what do you do? What do you have to know to be an astronaut? One of the first things we learn is about International Space Station systems. Here's a picture of the International Space Station. Um, it's been orbiting the Earth. We've had people living on it for the last 20 years, which is amazing. As long as you've been alive, there have been people living in low Earth orbit. One of the things we learn are all of the technical engineering systems, like the electrical power system that gives you light and power for all the different science equipment that we use. We learn how to heat up our food for dinner. Um, we, and we learn how to fix the toilet. Uh, basic things like that, uh, that you have to know how to live on space. Toilet breaks sometimes, and you have to know how to fix it. Here's a picture of the big pool I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is where we train how to do spacewalks. Now, these days, the, the days we're training to do spacewalks are really long and hard. The spacesuit is big. It weighs about 250 pounds, and you can't even walk in suit if you're, if you're not in the water. And I love these days, but it's kind of like running a marathon and doing a math test at the same time. You have to know the procedure that you're working on. So you have to know what you're doing and the equipment that you're working on and also, you know, the next steps that you're doing. And you have to know what your buddy's doing and be kind of talking to them the whole time so you know what their next steps are. And they're just really mentally and physically exhausting days, but also really cool days because uh, you're, you're in a spacesuit underwater. Another thing we do is fly T-38 jets. Uh, now, this is some of the most important training that we do because things can happen really fast in the jets. Um, things can happen really fast and you have to be able to react and then communicate with your co-pilot and also with the ground to make a good decision. Um, and this is very applicable to flying in spacecraft and working in the spacesuit, just kind of high stakes, high pressure environments. We also do a bunch of they, we also learn a lot of things that you might not even think astronauts need to know. Uh, we learn how to fix things. Um, here you can see one of my classmates, Frank, working on the T-38 jets that we fly. Uh, if something breaks in space, you can't go down the street to the store and buy a new part uh, or have someone come, you know, have the repairman come and fix it. It's up to you to fix, fix the thing or build a new part. We get training, um, basic medical training in case we or one of our teammates becomes sick or injured. We also get a lot of geology training. Uh, we learn how to communicate uh, the things that we see on the ground and also in the sky to the geologists back on Earth, both for the time when we're on space station looking at Earth and for the future someday when we're on, moon, on the moon. 
here you can see we also get to play with some of the prototype tools, some of the new tools that we might use someday on the moon. You can see me here with a rock coring drill that we use to take samples of solid rock. Finally, one of the most important aspects of our training is what we call expeditionary skills, and that is working together. Um, the most important thing we do is as a team. So being able to get along with people is extremely important. You can't be a jerk, whether you're working on Earth or in space. And so we, we train these skills every day in everything that we do. So this brings me to you. By the time that you guys finish school and um, are interested in maybe becoming an astronaut or an engineer or a journalist or a psychiatrist or a doctor, or a finance manager or whatever it is you're interested in doing because NASA needs all of those jobs. Um, by the time you're old enough to come work for NASA, we are going to have people living and working at the moon. But when I was, the, the last time people visited the moon, I was not even alive. Um, so this is really cool. Under NASA's Artemis program, we are going to go to the moon and stay there. We'll learn how to live there and work there and we'll develop the tools that we need to take the next giant leap to Mars. So why do we do all of this? You know, why, why do we spend all this time and training to explore space? I believe it's because space exploration has a very unique capability to unite the whole world together. We can do something together that we just, you just don't see it um, in many other areas. It teaches us, us, us about our history and where we may have come from, and it challenges us to be the greatest possible people we can be every day. And lastly, it shows us the value of our own home planet Earth, because in the end, we are really all just astronauts on spaceship Earth. Thank you. I think... Laurel, that was fantastic. This is Senator Capito, and that was fantastic. And students, how wonderful to know that when she was in elementary school, this is when she started her dream. So now we're going to go to the question portion, and we're going to uh, ask students to ask you a question, Laurel. So the first student that uh, is going to ask a question, and hopefully we'll get our connections uh, going well, is Alyssa Dinger at the Glenwood School. Alyssa, are you able to ask your question? We'll wait a minute or two here. Yes. You should be. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Hi. We can hear you. Yes, good, hi. 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 Um, hi. My question is, hi, Alyssa. Um, my question is, um, how do you communicate in space? Can you use phones to call or text in space? Um, yeah, so we can, astronauts on space station can actually pick up the phone and call their family and friends almost any time they want to. Um, once a week, they also get to video chat with their family and friends which uh, is actually like very similar to what we're doing right now. Um, living on the space station is actually very similar to having to stay at home like we all are this year during COVID. So anytime that you've been video chatting with your family and friends, uh, that you can probably imagine what it's like to be an astronaut in that case. Okay, our next question is from Rayanne Pierce a fourth grader at Spanishburg Elementary. Rayanne, are you there? What is your mission as an astronaut? Thanks, Rayanne, that's a great question. Um, so our mission as an astronaut, um, as astronauts, we train and fly in space, but um, our mission is much bigger than any one person or project that we work on. Um, we at NASA do really great things. We've been operating the International Space Station for 20 years. We're talking about sending people to the moon. And those are the kinds of projects that it takes a whole team of people to do. Um, you can't just do it as one person or even one country. It takes, takes the whole team coming together. 
And so our mission is really um, setting big goals for ourselves and pursuing those goals and succeeding with succeeding at those goals um, through an incredible amount of teamwork. Okay. Um, our next question is from Caitlin Artrip, a fourth grader at Mercer Elementary. Caitlin, over to you. How do you study the planets while you're in space? Thanks, Kaylin. That's a great question. So believe it or not, but the main planet the astronauts study uh, when we're in space right now is planet Earth. Every day there are astronauts who are uh, uh, making observations of things that are happening on Earth and taking pictures of Earth and sharing those observations with scientists on the ground. They're also doing science and testing different technologies that help people on the ground um, every day and help us to better understand um, our planet and how we can better take care of it. And I, if it's okay, Laurel, um, it, I'd like to maybe add on to that a little bit. Yep, uh, definitely. So, so the, it is an amazingly important question that we would go to space to study other planets. Um, as, as, as astronauts. And when we go to the moon, one of the values of the moon is that the far side of the moon doesn't have a bunch of radio signals and what we call electromagnetic interference that we have here on Earth. So it's extremely quiet, which means we can put really sensitive instruments on the far side of the moon and we can get more information about deep space than we've ever been able to get before. So we can see way out into space. And in fact, by doing that, we're actually looking back into time because of how much time it takes for light to travel to the earth and, and other parts of, of, of the spectrum, whether it's light spectrum or infrared or you know any part of the spectrum. So we'd like to put what's called a wire antenna on the far side of the moon in order to capture very low frequency signals that are coming from deep space and those very low frequency signals you know billions of years ago that would have been that would have been light <laughs> but as the universe expanded those signals expanded as well and so now now we could capture those signals um in in very low frequency rather than in in the the light part of the electromagnetic spectrum so there's so much we can learn about space by going to the moon and then on the far side of the moon, or even on the near side of the moon, for that matter, we can put we can put optics so that we can actually look at stars in deep space, and we can make assessments as to whether or not there are planets orbiting those stars. Now we're doing that right now, all the time. We're finding new planets around other stars. We now know that there's dozens of planets around every single star, but but finding those planets and then assessing, like Laurel said. Like, could there be life on those other worlds? I loved what Laurel had there with this non-photosynthetic life in her, in her presentation at the bottom of the ocean, living on these vents, coming out these, um, uh, I, I don't even know how that works, but it's not photosynthetic life, which is the life we understand. It's something entirely different. Um, and that's the kind of life that very well may exist on other planets. Laurel had a picture in her, in her presentation of a planet called Europa, which is an ice moon of Jupiter. And it's so it's it's got this ice shield that protects it. And inside it's a water world. The entire world is water. So there could be some of that non-photosynthetic life um, right there uh, in our own solar system. But from the moon with a really steady base like the moon, we can use optics to see planets around other stars. We can use antennas to collect signals from deep space from a long time. The, the moon is a great place for astronauts like Laurel to one day go do all of this amazing astrophysics. So it's going to be an exciting thing to see. Thank you. Our next question is Kenley Lister, who's a second grader from Oakville Elementary. Kenley? Sorry to be an astronaut. Can you ask one more? How do you get started to train to be an astronaut? How do you get oh, started to train to be an astronaut? That's a great question, Kenley. So 
I would say to start training to be an astronaut, first, you want to study hard and do well in all of your subjects, but especially in math and science. Second, you want to be a good friend. Um, you need to be able to get along with each other, with other people, no matter what you do. Third, take care of yourself. Uh, take care of your health and your body and eat good food. And lastly, just don't be afraid to try new things. Try new hobbies, make new friends, ask a lot of questions all the time. You can do anything you want to as long as you work hard and never stop learning. Okay, next we're going to Athens Elementary to hear from Mary Ellen Berkey. What's your question? Okay, Mary Ellen, are you there? Her, her question was, how do astronauts communicate with their families while they're in space? We're here. She's there. Okay, She's good. Okay, go ahead and ask about the family. Just ask about that. How do you communicate with your family? Uh, so astronauts can communicate with their families in space. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Uh, by telephone and also by video chat. So astronauts can actually pick up the phone and call people. Um, so you can get a call from space. Uh, we also can use video chat, just exa exactly like we're video chatting right now. Um, they can um, video, you know, once a week we get to get to video call with our friends and family. And that's, um, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, really similar, like when you're living on space station, um, you're kind of in this small space and you can't go anywhere. And that's exactly like most of us have been this year where we've been stuck in our house and we haven't been able to go anywhere. And so exactly like astronauts, we've learned how to start communicating with friends and family over video calls instead of in person. And we're, we're making that work. Um, and it's hard, but we're adapting. And that's exactly what astronauts do in space um, when they spend months and months up in space. You gotta make sure you're not too close. Okay, our next question is from Alexis Hannah Saunders, a third grader from Bush Fork Elementary. Alexis, do you have a question? Have you tried any space food? What is your favorite? Hi, Alexis. Uh, yes, I actually have gotten to try space food. Uh, NASA actually has a food science laboratory at Johnson Space Center where there are people who are food scientists. And it is their entire job to come up with new meals and new ways to package food for astronauts on space station. Yeah, you never thought that was a job, but it is. And so we've every now and then we get to sample these new foods and give them feedback. And I would say, Probably my favorite food has been chicken and noodles, which isn't that exciting, but it's comfort food and sometimes comfort food is good. Uh, that's a great answer. That's a great question. I've wondered that myself. Uh, we're going to go back to Oakville Elementary and Paisley Breeden has a question for you. Um. What were your favorite classes in school and how did they help you become an astronaut? Thanks, Paisley. My favorite classes in school when I was younger were science and English and art, actually. Um, and I think, and I, oh, I also really liked reading and I liked playing sports a lot. I played soccer, I ran cross country and track, and later on I rode. And so all of those things, I think, um, I think it's really helpful um, in being an astronaut to be really interested um, in a lot of different things because this helps you become a well-rounded person and also just gives you this wealth of experiences and knowledge to draw on when you're trying to solve a new problem um, or trying to do something new that's difficult that you've never done before. Uh, when you have all these different experience, life experiences and you know about a bunch of different subjects, it helps you come up with more creative ways to solve the problem and also helps you just communicate with, with people who have very different backgrounds. And so uh, my answer to that is that um, really, I think just um, being interested in a variety of things and studying all of the different subjects uh, really hard um, is helpful to being an astronaut. Okay, next we're going to Mercer Elementary. We have a fifth grader who has a question. Ariel Showalters, are you ready? 
countries. Uh, what type? What type of What that she asked was. Once a space shuttle reaches space, what type of fuel does it run on? Ah, Ariel, that's a good question. So different spaceships um, use different kinds of fuels. The space shuttle that you asked about actually uses two chemicals called monomethylhydrazine and dinitrogen the tetroxide. However, what I think is cool though, is that once any spacecraft reaches space, once it gets to orbit, the entire time you're in orbit, you are constantly falling back to Earth's surface because of gravity. So the entire time you're in orbit, you're really just falling around Earth, falling back towards Earth. So the fuel that spacecraft use um, and the way they stay in orbit is actually thrusters. So you, you use the thrusters to um, continually boost the spacecraft higher so that you don't fall back to Earth. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. All right, I, I, I just think that is amazing. That, yeah, and a, a lot of people don't realize, Laurel, and uh, maybe the young folks don't, when you're in space, you're not just, you're not just floating stagnant. Your, your, your horizontal velocity is faster than the acceleration of gravity, which means you are falling back to the Earth, but you're moving forward so fast that as you fall back to the Earth, you're actually falling around the Earth all the time which is uh, really, I think, uh, <laughs> it's astonishing. You have to go, here, here's what Laurel didn't tell you. You have to go 17,500 miles per hour to stay in low Earth orbit, which is um, pretty impressive. Um, okay, let's see. Our next question is from Autumn Triolo at, at Glenwood School. Is Autumn there? What is the scariest situation you have been in while you were in space? Um, that's a good question. So I haven't actually been in space yet, um, but I have gotten to do a lot of different training that um, if it wasn't, it was scary because I didn't know, you know, if I would do a good job or what, you know, how it would turn out. But what I found is that with my classmates and I, um, as we learned together and trained together and worked together, um, we always helped each other all the way through. So um, we all came in with very different backgrounds and um, different aspects of our training has been challenging for different people, um, depending on our backgrounds and our personalities. But as we went through training, we all helped each other every step of the way. So if something was hard for me, there was somebody there you know, one of my friends was there to help me. And if something was hard for somebody else, I was there to try to help them. And so that's was really valuable. Um, and so whenever I've had one of those scary moments or whenever there's been a time where I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about this. Uh, this is scary or I'm not sure. Um, it's been great because um, I've always been able to rely on a friend and likewise, um, my friends and classmates have been, been able to rely on me. So Laurel, when you go to space, how long can you stay? Um, so we don't actually know how long, um, at this point, how long it is, how long it's just safe for astronauts to be there. But that's one of the main reasons that we have the International Space Station and we have astronauts um, spending longer and longer amounts of time there. And that's the reason why we're going back to the moon uh, to study and research how the human body adapts to space. Um, and so that we understand those challenges um, associated with spending longer and longer amounts of time in space. Um, and we need to understand this because when we go to Mars, for example, and we do a mission like that, um, that'll be on the order of magnitude of years. And so we need to know um, how to take care of our astronauts on those missions. Okay, we have a question from Grayson Wright, who's a fourth grader at Spanishburg Elementary. Grayson? I'm not sure Grayson, I'm not hearing her. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask her question. Um, what is it like working for NASA? I think we can tell how excited you are about it. <laughs> uh, but what is it, so I'm gonna rephrase her question just a little bit and say, when, your friends from when you were in second, third, and fourth grade, or, or you know, elementary school, ask you where do you work, and you say you're from NASA. How does that make you feel? 
Uh, it makes me feel great. NASA is such an exciting place to work. Um, first off, I mean, my favorite thing about NASA is the people that I work with. And that, I don't just mean the other astronauts. I mean, the people, the instructors, the people who train us, the engineers and the scientists and, um, you know, everyone here in Russia who I work with all over the world, the people who are involved in the space program are incredible and they do their very best every single day. And they challenge you to do your very best as well. Um, they're also just really excited about the mission. Um, we're working on uh, we're working on projects that have a global impact that are that are going to do that are going to take us places that we've never been. And as a human species, we can't even imagine you know what we're going to find there and what kind of experiences we're going to have. And so there's really just um, being at NASA kind of every day, going into the office and being at work. There's just all of this excitement, and especially right now with the Artemis program. Um, that as we're getting ready to go back to the moon, we're testing hardware and we're starting to figure out how are we going to train astronauts. Like one of the craziest things that I saw recently was a picture, you know, that big pool that I showed you guys earlier, the neutral buoyancy lab, the giant swimming pool. Um, right now we have astronauts who we've got rocks on the bottom of that pool and we have astronauts who are wearing the brand new spacesuits that we are going to use to explore the moon. They are testing those spacesuits and they're testing the tools we're going to use on the moon. Um, and that's in the pool in Houston happening now. And so there's just all of this enthusiasm and excitement and energy right now at NASA that um, I just, it's an, ex and it's an incredible place to work. That's a great answer. And Laurel, thank you. We have a little bit of extra time and they told me that I could ask a question and Carol could ask a question and students, uh, <laughs> I think we've got a couple questions um, that they kind of wrote into the chat. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question that uh, I hope I say your name right. Asia Monroe. I don't have that. Oh, we might have lost. Senator Capito's video feed. Okay. Uh, Do you should I ask a question while we're waiting for yes, ma'am, to get back on? Sounds good. I'm I'm really I've got lots of questions, but I'm curious. Your first there, oh there she is, Laurel. Did you get to answer that? Oh, sorry, ma'am, we lost your feed for just a second. Um, but okay. Representative Miller was going to go ahead and ask a question. Um, Perfect. And I guess we'll go back to you. <laughs> sorry. Well, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I don't want to get right here. But uh, one of the other students had written into the oh. chat: When you go to space, are you going to be afraid that you might crash? That's a good question, and that's one that we get asked pretty often. Um, you know, what are we worried about when we go to space? And by the time we go to space, we've done so much training. We've had so much preparation that um, we can get into, we can strap ourselves into the rocket and be totally focused on the job because we trust that we've been well prepared by the ground teams and that everyone has taken care of their job and that we're ready to go and do the mission. And so, no, uh, when I think about going to space, I'm, you know, I think about how I'll miss my family or how I'll miss things on earth, but I'm not worried about crashing because I know that by the time I go to space, I'll be really well prepared and the whole team will be ready for that mission. Great, thanks. Carol? Okay, with all your training um, in the swimming pool, your first experience without gravity, did it feel the same? Did it feel differently? What, what was it like for you? Uh, so the first time getting in the spacesuit is completely unlike anything that you've ever done before. It's, Actually, spacewalk training is the one thing that no matter what anyone did in their previous career and the rest of their life, they come to NASA and they've never put on a spacesuit and they've never tried to work in it underwater. So that is the one thing that we all show up completely knowing nothing about. And let's see, the first time that I put on the spacesuit, um, you put it on, it's this big bulky thing, and uh, you know, you have your space helmet and they lower you into the water on a frame. And so they hoist you, they use a crane and they hoist you in and you're, you're, get it, you're being lowered down into the water and looking out of your visor bubble. And they tell you to close your eyes and then open them. And so just because so, it can get a little disoriented if you don't close your eyes. So I closed my eyes, 
you're going underwater and then I open them. And the first thing I see is the mock-up of space station. So in the swimming pool, the entire main beam of space station is mocked up. And when you go underwater and open your eyes for the first time, you just see space station right there in front of you. And it's huge and it's cool. And it's, you're like, whoa, you know, you can really imagine like what it must be like to see it in space for the first time. And so that was really, that was the, that was my first and la most lasting image from the first time in the spacesuit. Uh, the rest of that particular day uh, consisted of me, you know, fumbling with tools and trying to basically learn how to use a completely different body. Um, your hands are bigger, you're bulkier, and it's hard to move around. And so even just fumbling, you know, with a wrench, for example, or drill, trying to use the drill, that we use, um, that's everything's just a little bit harder. So you have to relearn everything. That's neat. Okay, I asked one more question that came in on the box from Jordan Price. Uh, Laurel, she says, I read that the moon is getting further away from us and the sun is getting closer. What do you think NASA will do in the future about that? <laughs> Uh, well, let's start with, is that a fact? <laughs> and what are well, you going to do about it? I was going to say the time scales that we're talking here are extremely long. So as like, for, as we're looking at going back to the moon, if the moon is getting any farther away from Earth, then uh, it's imperceptible to us. And so like geologic time scales are huge. Um, and so uh, we won't have to really deal with that in our in our lifetimes, or even anytime soon. Good. Can it's uh, it, it's actually, it's, it's the, the moon is moving away from the earth at about one and a half inches per year. One and a half inches okay. per year. And it's about a, it's about a 240,000 mile journey to the moon. So out of 240,000 miles, uh, it's moving about one and a half inches per year. So it's like, like Laurel said, it's not, not anything that we're terribly worried about at this time. Well, that, that puts it in perspective. I have one last it does put question. It in. My grandson went to NASA space camp. Did you ever get to go there? And, and does it spur you on to wanting to do more of this? Um, I actually never got to go to space camp, but a lot of my classmates did. They all had rave reviews. Can they go more than one year? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know someone who went to space camp seven times. And became an astronaut? No. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you listen, so much. Yes, listen, I want to thank you, Laurel, and, and you, Jim uh, Bridestein, for all your great work at NASA, for letting us bring into, uh, into our schools your incredible knowledge. And I will have to say, I was very impressed that Jordan Price knew that the moon was getting further away from us even if it's only an I, inch and a half a year i'm like she's reading her and she's reading her science hey I'm, so, a, I'm a, i was impressed and i'm an astronaut <laughs> well maybe we have a one one budding one in mercer county i also was informed that this is the largest participation that uh, the nasa uh, back to school um program has had and and the stem virtual event so i'm really proud of all of our teachers I want to give them a great shout out. I know these are difficult situations for them and for the students. So I just shows you how excited people are about NASA. So that's my wrap up. I don't know if anybody else needs uh, or, or wishes to say. I would like to thank LaCosta Hodges at uh, the principal at Oakville Elementary because she's the one that we've sort of been relying on to help us with this. And Laura, we're, we're, you're going to have a lot of cheerleaders when you go to space. <laughs> we can't wait to, to see you in that space suit doing, uh, doing wonderful things. So thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Senator, I would just like to say again, thank you to you for hosting this and to Representative Miller. Thank you for all of your support for the imp important programs that we have underway. Uh, your leadership is, is absolutely essential to us being successful. Um, and so we thank you. And, and I'll turn it over to Laurel for a final word. Thank you. I just wanted to say thanks to all of you. You guys had some great questions and that was I had a blast talking with you guys. And the one thing I just want to leave you with is next time you go outside and look up at the moon, just try to imagine what it's going to be like, because in a couple of years, 
you can't, you're going to be able to walk outside and look up at the moon and there will be people there and you'll, and at the very moment you're looking at it, there will be people standing on the moon. And just, just next time you look at the moon, think about how that's going to feel because there are exciting things coming and we are all a part of it. And we can't wait for you guys to finish school and come join us. Awesome. Great. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank that you. concludes today's event. Take care. Thank you.